Um, <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you who uh, weren't in the room when we started, I'm Dr. Glenn Caddy and I'm the moderator for the next uh, uh, two days. Okay, this is the actual definition of parental alienation that at least I'm using in my talk. Uh, the child allies himself strongly with one parent, rejects the relationship with the other parent without legitimate justification, right? That's alienation. And if you want to look at it schematically, people use these terms in different ways. The, the way I'm using it is this, this is the alienation. In other words, it's the child who uh, cut false, has false beliefs that this person, the alienated parent, is uh, evil or dangerous, and the child rejects it. So, so one thing, you can think about parental alienation being this, this little uh, wiggle. Or, if you want to, you can think of it about being this relationship. In other words, if it were in the diagnosis code as a relational problem, the parental alienation is something that exists between the child and this parent, the, the dysfunctional relationship. The, when the, the word parental and parental alienation means this person, the rejected parent. Or, if you really want to, some people don't do it that way, some people use the term like this, that parental alienation is what this parent, the preferred parent, is doing. That parental alienation refers to what the alienating parent is doing. I realize it's a little bit confusing, Maybe in the course of today and tomorrow, you, you, you need to kind of keep it straight that people use these words in different ways. And just to make it good, I mean, you really could think of it that, that parental alienation is the whole shebang. In other words, it's the whole uh, process within the family, the family system that leads this to happen. So I mentioned accidental. Here's, here's an example. You know, you have a little girl who has asthma, the idea is that that's something the mom is going to worry about. And the mom says, I love you, I miss you, I can't wait for you to come home, I've been worried sick, and so on. And, and, and accidental, the mom, the mom here is not purposefully trying to undermine or sabotage the child's relationship, but that is in fact what happens. The relationship with the dad gets compromised, and then the child says something like, Dad, you're being mean to mommy, I hate you you're going to hear a whole day's worth of intervention, what to do with this, what, whether it's a mild case or a severe case. So let's not, uh, let's, I, I'm not going to really get in right now to the intervention. So what about if, if the parenting who's doing the uh, indoctrination is doing it on purpose? And this is what most of us think about as a full-fledged parental alienation, and that the preferred parent is persistent and is actively and consciously and knowingly uh, influencing the child to dislike the other parent and the, or make, take steps to exclude the parent from the child's life. And of course, this results in a whole process that goes back and forth. The rejected parent isn't just sitting there being a happy person. The rejected parent gets very frustrated and might then do things to aggravate the situation even further. Uh, by not being perfect, the rejected parent may, may do things that the child can then say as a reason, look, daddy did not take me out for ice cream like he said he was going to. You know, no wonder I don't want to ever see him again. Um, so we're talking differential diagnosis, so the, the diagnosis to think about is, uh, in the child, is parental alienation. But I think the parent who uh, perpetrates these things almost always has some kind of personality disorder because that parent is so determined to capture the child and to undermine the child's relationship with the other parent. And then it's so intense and it's so pervasive and, and, and it's persistent that something's going on in that parent's mind that is not the way most of us think. 
So people have studied, some of these parents are narcissistic, some of them are antisocial, some of them are borderline. What's motivating them, if, probably you all have, know about this book, Children Held Hostage uh, by Clower and Rivlin, which was published by the American Bar Association. But I, I just got this list of motivators out of them. I mean, and I mentioned this because this is one of the very early books that describes parental alienation just on a behavioral way without a whole lot of theorizing. But, um, you know, they talk about the alienator wanting revenge, uh, wanting to own the child, sometimes doing it for self-protection. What that means is if the alienating parent has some sort of problem that they're trying to cover up, they might try to indoctrinate the child in order to cover up something that's gone on in their household. So this is my, the last thing on that list. The last thing on the list of the differential diagnosis. This is when it goes beyond simply intense persistent indoctrination. This is when the alienating parent has some sort of delusion about the dad, well, let, let's assume for the moment it's the mom who has the delusion, about the dad and perhaps about other people. And that this is a delusional disorder and it's, she talks about it so much and discusses it with the child and shares it with the child that the child adopts the same delusion. So th this is a condition that doesn't happen very often in general psychiatry, it does happen every so often I mean, and obviously it's not always with a parent and a child. Frequently it's with people who live in the same household, like a woman and her sister. And usually the first woman is the one with the primary psychosis, and then the sister who's enmeshed with the, with the first woman adopts the psychosis that the first woman has. You follow that? In other words, so that's a situation where the shared psychotic disorder might be between two siblings, two adult siblings. But what we're talking about is where it's between the parent and the child. And uh, of course the other term for this is shared psychotic, well obviously this can result in parental alienation because the child refuses to go see the other parent without adequate reason. Uh, the DSM diagnosis is, is shared psychotic disorder or which, you know, the old name for this was folia de. And usually the parent who initiates this has, has a serious uh, diagnosable psychotic condition, like delusional disorder or schizophrenia. And here's a little example. So this is a mother who has lots of delusions. The CIA is tracking her. She herself was sexually abused by her parents in satanic rituals, which I, I checked into that, and that was a delusion. Her husband, her ex-husband is videotaping uh, the things that he's doing with his daughter, with the little girl. And then the little girl, I mean, those are all delusional. I mean, th this all gets investigated and you know, it, it, it appears to be delusional what the, mom, what the mom is thinking. But the little girl gets wrapped up in this and so the little girl herself starts having the same delusions that the mom has, that she's only eight. She says, that she recites that the father comes into her room, takes photographs of her takes videos of her. So that's an example of shared psychotic disorder. And if you can prove that, if you can show it, I mean, obviously that's a very, very serious condition and you can't just sit down with everybody and do psychotherapy and, and make it go away. It's not gonna go away. And you really have to protect the child. I mean, the, it, this is one situation that's pretty black or white, that you have to remove the child from the influence of the psychotic parent. And hopefully, hopefully you can get the, the delusional parent into some sort of treatment and perhaps um, help that person resolve their issues. So anyway, uh, I think we're running out of the last two minutes here. Um, so anyway, this is our list that I ch showed you in the first place. And um, this is uh, what I would conclude, that if you're involved in one of these cases, please don't just jump to the conclusion that one of these things on this list is the, the explanation. And certainly don't jump to the conclusion that parental alienation is, is the explanation for every time the child doesn't want to go see the other parent. 
you really have to sit back, you have to collect information. You almost always have to collect information from both the mom and the dad. It would be very hard to sort out the differential diagnosis in one of these cases. Maybe and sometimes you can, but it would be very hard usually to figure it out just by seeing the child or, or the child and one parent. You really, almost always you need to see everybody to, to really understand what's going on. Why, um, why do we even go to all this trouble? Uh, you know, I, I've been on this big campaign to get parental alienation in the DSM, but why do we even want to do this? Well, the, the, the main reason to get in the DSM is to educate mental health professionals that it exists, and so that when this kind of phenomenon happens, it'll be, it'll be an, an official thing to be looking out for. And that the basic idea is that mental health professionals will be prepared to evaluate these kids and, and identify them sooner, sooner when the alienation or the refusal is milder. That's why I think parental alienation should be in the DSM that, we, that we've been working on. It's, it, the, the primary reason doesn't have to do with court. It doesn't have to do with insurance. The primary reason is so that me, the mental health professionals will, will be more alert and will be able to identify these kids earlier when the situation is, is more treatable. Did I run out of time? Okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, so with that said, uh, Dr. Burnett, would you like to come forward? Thanks. So this is May 2011. I got involved in this project of campaigning to get parental alienation in the DSM-5. This is the, my third anniversary. I started in May 2008. And I wanted to, a lot of people asked me, how's it going? What's the status? What's gonna happen? And I'm gonna give you a very quick update. So in, in our proposals, we actually have said that there are several different ways that parental alienation might show up in DSM-5. And these are the three possibilities. That it could be considered a mental disorder. Mental disorders are the things in the front part of the DSM. The, they're, you know, the, the axis one, two, and so on, diagnoses that we think of every day as diagnoses. So perhaps it could be there as a mental disorder. Another possibility is it could be a relational problem. These are V codes. You know, these are in the back of DSM. There's another chapter for V codes. So this is another way that parental alienation might be in DSM-5. It would be called parental alienation relational problem with its own number, V something or other. And there's a third possibility. As you know, there's another chapter in DSM uh, which has something about criteria uh, for further study. And that's an interesting chapter. It has things that haven't quite met the criteria to be a full-fledged mental disorder, but it's possible that parental alienation could be there. So uh, the reason why I'm dwelling on this is because when this topic comes up, I frequently, people say almost out of reflex, oh, there's not enough research for it to be in DSM. And they're, they're not even thinking about all these different possibilities. Because to be a mental disorder, it really does take a much higher level of research. But simply to be a simple old parental alienation relational problem doesn't take as much. And certainly, to be in the chapter for criteria for further study it doesn't take as much. Now, I've, I'll tell you kind of where we, we're standing now. I've talked to hundreds of people about this, and many, many people don't like the idea of a, of a disorder. They don't like the idea of labeling the child with a mental disorder. But almost everybody likes the idea, who, who, who even likes it at all in DSM, uh, thinks that the relational problem is the way to go. Parental alienation, relational problem. So that's what I'm betting on right now. I, I was at a meeting of, uh, about a week ago with people from the American Psychiatric Association and I had some conversations with the people who are kind of in charge of this process. And as far as I can tell, no decision has been made. It's still being considered. It's on their to-do list. It's on their website. If you go to the DSM-5 website, this is listed as one of the things they're thinking about. So just the update is, 
it's still under consideration. So what we've actually done over a period of time, we submitted uh, two different formal proposals. Uh, we, we, the proposals were published in journal articles in the American Journal of Family Therapy, and Dr. Sauber here was very helpful in getting these things published. He's the editor of that journal. Um, we published uh, a book, uh, which is here. The, um, uh, the, the book contains the actual proposal, but also a lot of other extra information. And actually, somebody here very kindly s submitted this question. Are there any good peer-reviewed research articles that provide evidence supporting the existence of parental alienation syndrome as a real existing identifiable disorder? And they're all in the book. In other words, we, part of the, the point of the book was really to convince these committees that there is research. And we over, we, we, you know, we had a lot of people helping me, and we, the, we, the bibliography is enormous. There are more than 500 references in this. There are books, there are articles in professional literature, not just in newspapers, but in professional literature, 500 articles from 30 countries. We have articles from all over the world. We have articles from Latvia and South Africa and Malaysia on this topic. And the reason why it's, it's both because we're, we're trying to convince both the SM5 and ICD to, uh, you know, which is put out by the World Health Organization. So anyway, um, there, there are plenty of references in the book if you're interested. Let me just mention real quick uh, that I didn't do this all by myself, that part, but I collected this committee of uh, about 70 people, and they're also from many countries. They're from 12 different countries. So I'm, I'm just gonna show you. The ones that are in red are actually part of this meeting, and, th and they're here, or, or actually they were gonna be here. I think Dr. Bone's not able to be here, but he was gonna be here anyway. But I kind of like to brag on some of my committee members. Just let me mention some of these people. Doctor, uh, you, you probably have never heard of this guy, Paul Ben Susan. He's a uh, forensic psychiatrist in France. Dr. Ben Susan last year got the Legion of Honor Medal from the government of France because of his work in uh, doing forensic child psychiatry and in, in doing sex abuse uh, evaluations for court, in which he, his evaluations kept people, kept a group of people out of prison. That was an extremely embarrassing situation for the French government. And he got the Legion of Honor. That's sort of neat. Uh, who else do I just want to mention here? Uh, I want to brag on a couple of people. Dr. Greenhill is the president, the current president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Keenan is the president of the American Society of Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, some of these people, you, I'm sure you've heard of Demos Lorandos, maybe. Uh, Dr. Miller is here with us today. Whoops. Uh, here's Dr. Sauber. Dr. Warren Klein is going to be here tomorrow, I think. Um, to, to, to. Anyway, we, we, it's a pretty distinguished group, and, and they come from a lot of different countries. So I just wanted to give you that update. And the, the basic bottom line of the update is it isn't decided. It's still being considered. It's somewhere on their list of things to think about. So uh, let's go over some of these questions which we appreciate very much. Um, incidentally, the reason why I was first is not because I'm such a nice guy or anything, but I, I, my talk was logical in how you think about these problems. In other words, the differential diagnosis of contact refusal is sort of the, the starting point of the discussion if you're doing an evaluation. And the people later in the day are gonna talk in much greater detail about what you do then, what might happen then, what kind of treatment might you do, either now or in the future, et cetera. So some of the questions that were posed pertain more to the people who are gonna be later. But here's a couple of questions that are almost the same. So let's do this first. What if a child exhibits more than one symptom of contact refusal? In other words, perhaps he has oppositional defiant, perhaps he's worried, perhaps he's escaping conflict, uh, Perhaps there's a purposeful indoctrination. In other words, what if there are several things going on all at the same time? 
And this other person said the same thing. What if you come across a child that presents multiple symptoms of alienation, stubbornness, plus conflict, blah, 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 plus shared psychotic. So what do you do? Well, that's a really good question. And what it, what it really means is that in, in that long list of things that I showed you, I, I took a somewhat simple-minded approach, you know, and that I, I attempted to talk about them one at a time. But the people who wrote these questions realized that comorbidity occurs, in other words, it would be easy to imagine how, how a child might have two or three of these phenomena or these conditions all happening at the same time. And I think the simple answer to what do you do is you try to figure out what the worst one is. In other words, if the child is oppositional now and then and anxious now and then, but the, but the underlying, the most serious thing you, you, can, you can identify is that purposeful indoctrination is going on and that parental alienation is happening, then you would really, your treatment plan would, would almost certainly revolve around whatever that is. In other words, the most serious condition you would think of, you would be thinking about what to do about that. And then perhaps there would be minor modifications for these other less serious things. So that's a very general answer. But I think there are going to be much more discussion later in the day about the treatment of parental alienation, and, and I think some of the speakers might be able to, to, uh, to address that somewhat also. Bill, let me just make a comment about that. One of, the, one of the other considerations regarding that is that if you effectively manage the most complex issue, often the other underlying issues uh, will simply fade away because the driving force, the psychic pressure connected to the impact of the first event, the most primary event, uh, is often producing differential secondary consequence, and those secondary consequence issues will simply dry up as a result of the larger solution. I kind of like this question. Does parental alienation always originate from the other parent, the preferred parent? In other words, is it possible for this disorder to exist without the other parent's involvement? Well, I think the answer is yes. And I, in, in my talk, I, I gave the example where there's extreme hostility going on, lots and lots of fighting. Nobody is doing indoctrination, but both parents are contributing to the fighting, and the fighting is so intense that the child runs for cover and gravitates to one side and shuns the other side. So the, that parent is doing something. That parent is fighting, but that parent is not actively indoctrinating the child. And I think that occasionally, Parental alienation is the end result of that. But I think, I'm, I think the writer of this question might have even something further in mind. I think there are occasional situations where somebody other than the preferred parent is making this happen. And occasionally, I think there are therapists who get very involved in their case. They get very enmeshed with their case. And they start to identify with for instance, the mother, say the mother is who has brought the child to see the therapist. They get very identified with the mother and with the child and who has some resistance to seeing the dad. And the, and the therapist then starts asking questions and starts assuming that the child has some reason for not wanting to see dad and so on and so on. So I think occasionally external people, and there are some people in Europe who have written articles about this. I don't know exactly, they're not exactly called therapists, but they're, I think they're sort of like caseworkers associated with the child protection system in Europe, where, where, the, where some people have seen this over and over again, where those people, those case managers get so involved that they induce the parental alienation and it's not the preferred parent. And finally, occasionally there are other relatives. Occasionally there are grandparents who are really at the root of this process. So I had a couple. I, th I think Glenn was going to uh, punt a couple of these to some of the other panelists. Um, yes, Bill. Um, I, what I'd like to do is uh, ask Doug uh, to perhaps respond to this one. Um, is the enmeshed child with the parent who exhibits personality disorder likely to develop the same personality traits? And how permanent are these, is the question. This is a good question, and it's one of the examples of the lack of research. We don't have an answer, but every child depends on a parent to 
to interpret for them the world around them. And if that interpretation is severely distorted, then the child is going to get a distorted perception of the world around them. Part of the difficulty, and I'm going to talk about this, is really the lack of research, and I think part of the reason why you're even here, because these are good questions that we don't know the answer. For an example, there's a lot of research that shows the damage to children exposed to high conflict. But the research does not use the word parental alienation. And we, you know, as Dr. Bennett so rightfully mentioned, there really is a difference between what you might see as high conflict as opposed to what is truly parental alienation. So we don't have an answer. My feeling, my experience, is you cannot make that assumption that a child exposed to alienation is therefore going to have a personality disorder. I don't think you can make that assumption. But research suggests it could impair future relationships, but maybe not to the extent of a personality disorder. Better get up in here and do this one too while we're about it. Um, I'm having trouble reading it, but the question is, oh, sorry. The, the question is, the alienated child is now 44 years old um, and has not spoken to mum for 10 years. Dad is alcoholic, delusional, has had psychotic episodes, threatened homicide. Um, looks bipolar, what is, the hope if <laughs> what is the hope, if any, for reunification? Um, and mum, of course, after, um, I can't read some of this. Um, anyway, the idea is, what's the hope for unification when there's been such a level of um, alleged pathology in, in one parent? When I wrote my first book that came out in 98, it was really a very pessimistic book, basically saying there is no hope. <clears throat> we have learned there is hope. And part of it has come from the studies that myself and Dr. Barb Steinberg had done, and this was actually part of my presentation, where we found 27 adult child who were victims of alienation who somehow reunified. And we wanted to understand how did that happen? Well, it was kind of interesting uh, because we did this through follow-up interviews. One is that the reunification can occur, but it did not occur because of court intervention. Secondly, and I don't want to depress you, it did not happen because of mental health intervention. The common denominator was a crisis in the alienated child's life, child slash adult, that gave them reason to reach out to the targeted parent. What we found in follow-up is kind of a split, one-third, one-third, one-third. One-third of the people who reunified in the sense that they were able to communicate with each other really did not create any kind of emotional bond. They, they talked for a while, and then really the relationship kind of dissolved but they were both okay with that. Another third was more of a cooperative interaction. Maybe now we'll exchange Christmas and all that. But again, there really was not that close emotional bond. The third group <clears throat> did have emotional bond. It was almost sort of like the old Salem commercial where people are running and they come and hug each other in the field, you know. But the point I'm making <clears throat> is how reunification appears can be very, very different. But the other point that I'm making is that there is hope, and we do talk about how to set that up. Uh, now, this other person who asked the question obviously raised a lot of other issues. Let me say this. I have talked to adults who were alienated, and they really directed their anger towards the alienating parent. Okay. This is something alienated parents have to understand. Is you can be the target of that child's rage. And I'm thinking of this one young man that I wrote about where he started to rebuild the relationship and then his father died. <clears throat> he could not look at his mother in her face without crying and without really wanting to assault her when he realized what happened. That's the risk that an alienating parent takes. But there is hope. So hopefully I answered the question. 
Of course, one of the problems is that the alienating parent never has any appreciation of this when they're engaging in the alienation. And so in some respects, they're not only setting up circumstances for their, for their child or children, they're setting up circumstances for themselves without any cognizance of understanding or appreciating the future. So this has to do with a stubborn child or an oppositional defiant child. What you haven't examined is the possibility that the alienating parent is not the one rewarding the oppositional behavior. In other words, I gave the example of the kid staying home and going fishing instead of visiting the other parent. So in that case, the alienating parent is in a sense rewarding the, the oppositionality. But this writer says it's possible that the other parent, the, the uh, rejected parent or the alienated parent might be, might be creating it in their own way. And, and the example here, suppose there's a manipulating child who rejects contact and then when the child re rejects contact, it induces the parent to reach out and provide more benefits. In other words, you have a manipul manipulative child who's oppositional and defiant, who tricks the rejected parent into giving him things uh, in order to spend time with that parent. And all that makes sense. I mean, kids are very clever. I mean, <laughs> kids are very, have self-interest, and so you can certainly see how that might happen. Uh, so, so it's an interesting thing. Uh, <laughs> And it's an interesting little wrinkle because in many of these situations, when you do the initial assessment, you don't really know exactly what's happening. But that's the kind of thing that you might discover if you're meeting with them in either in a treatment role or a reunification therapist role or even in a parenting coordinator role. In one of these roles, you, you could conceivably figure out what this writer just said, exactly what's happening, and then obviously try to correct it. So here, this is interesting. What is the average, this is an impossible, one of these impossible questions. What is the average age when an alienated child finally wakes up and realizes that he or she has been manipulated or brainwashed by the alienating parent, which would pave the way for reconciliation with the targeted parent? I mean, that's a really good question. And the answer, of course, it could be any age and, and it, it could happen in different, many, many different ways. And I'll, I'll just run a couple of, of possibilities by you. Uh, age five, little boy is with dad, and the dad and the dad's therapist that he's hired and other people in the family are convinced that this little boy is terrified to death of his mother, and, it, and the, the, the little boy doesn't want to see the mother, the little boy is afraid of the mother, the little boy uh, d n doesn't even want to see her in, in a restaurant, d doesn't want any letters, the, the little, I mean, he's a little, little kid, he's only f five years old and he's totally terrified and he never wants to see mother again. And we worked this up and I felt that the dad and the dad's therapist had induced all this, the child was alienated, and the child should go back to the mom where he started. And, but everybody said, oh no, no, it's, it, it's gonna scare him to death. And the, but the judge agreed with me and the judge ordered it, so we arranged for, for this to happen in a very kind of controlled situation. And what happened? They're in the driveway, the, the, the mom is getting out of her car, the kid is in the driveway, the kid runs to the mom and hugs her. So there wasn't any alienation. In other words, the so-called parental alienation was just in the mind of the people who had been working with the child and who had isolated the child from the mom. But when the kid sees the mom, there, it really wasn't even there. So that's one example to think about. My, my, the moral of that story is when people say, well, how severe is it in the child? Sometimes you really don't know until you get the child and these targeted parent together. Uh, another example about how long does it take, which was, was a, as a teenage, a teenage boy who testified in court all the bad things dad had done, all the reasons why he shouldn't be seeing dad, and all the reasons why he should be with mom, and so, and so on and so on. So he, the judge left him with mom, and gave a little bit of visitation with dad. And it goes fine, the, the kid has a good time in visitation, they, they have interests, they go play baseball and so on. So, so it isn't, it, it, uh, in this case, I guess I wouldn't really call it alienation, but the kid did tell all sorts of stories about why he shouldn't be seeing dad. So a couple of months goes by and the kid apologizes to dad 
and says, you know, I'm really sorry, but obviously I made all that stuff up. Mom told me all that stuff to say, and I said it in front of the judge. I testified in front of the judge. And Dad says, well, let's see what we can do about it. So they, they go back to the attorney, and sure enough, they go back to court. In other words, this is an example where superficially it looked like parental alienation, but actually the kid was, was just, he was knowingly, purposefully. He wasn't really indoctrinated to the point where he believed it, but he, he, know, he was doing it on purpose. And he goes back to the judge and he says, I, judge, I lied, I made it all up. My mother told me to do this and say this and, and et cetera. So that's another example where it, it went away uh, and the, the error got cleared in a fairly easy way. Um, sometimes people, it happens in adulthood after they leave the home, after the alienated child leaves the home of the alienated parent and goes away to college, they reach out to the rejected parent. Sometimes some sort of crisis happens in, in his life when they, they need emergency support and they call up the person they haven't token, talked to for five years and they say, hi, mom, you know, it's me. Can we talk? So it happens in many different ways and sometimes it doesn't happen at all. I guess you know that sometimes adults uh, continue to be alienated. So that's the, why this is a hard question that there really isn't an average age. So this is a question for the audience. I want somebody here to come up and answer this question because this has to do with a movie, a movie that I did not see. <laughs> the movie is the, is the movie called The Wrestler. And the question is, how would you hypothetically suggest a therapist to deal with the parental problematic dynamics observed between Mickey Rourke's character in the movie, The Wrestler, and the daughter in the movie? So have you all, did everybody see that movie already? I, I don't know the answer. Do, 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 you want to, do you want to take a shot at it? <clears throat> This big chance. I would say that I, I saw the film. Uh, Nicky Rourke was nominated for an Oscar for that film. And <laughs> yeah. People here might know or not know. The, and on the film, the, the main character is a professional wrestler. And because of that profession demanding <laughs> the person to travel all the time, it leads to this person totally neglecting his wife and his daughter. He never sees her and then a lot later in life he's diagnosed with a heart, uh, heart problems and he knows he's going to die and now he wants to reveal the tie to the child with it down at all and the daughter wants no part of him. She gives him a chance and on the film we find out that they, they have made attempts before and every time they make an attempt this guy, the, the father, basically uh, brings down the illusions of the child because he, every time he makes the appointment to meet with her, he, he has dreams, he has alcohol, he has promiscuous sex, and the, 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 the daughter gets to a point where she does no longer ever want to uh, ever get in contact with the father. Thank you very, thank you very much. So this, from what you're describing, so this sounds like a case of estrangement rather than alienation because the dad is contributing, the dad is creating the problematic behaviors for the reasons that the daughter doesn't want to hang out with him. And uh, so that, but that's, that, that's a, a good description. Thank you. Do you have some more? Um, no, I don't have any more questions. Um, I've, got a, I've got a comment about the, the significance though of the sort of work that uh, Dr. Burnett has doing as far as these particular issues are concerned, they really, it, it is incredibly important to appreciate the significance of the difference between estrangement and uh, legitimate parental alienation. Uh, it's not only extremely important clinically, um, as he has made the point, but so many of these matters also find their way into the legal process and the legal process is incredibly ineffective in many instances trying to sort these things out. Uh, and they take very simple, uh, simplistic solutions to very complex issues. 
and um, so, and and it's so easy uh, to get it wrong. It's so easy for even professionals who are relatively experienced in child matters, family matters, to get it wrong because they may not have the specific experience. Even people with experience in high conflict divorces don't necessarily understand the very powerful and subtle dynamics that exist in parental alienation and in children who have been truly alienated versus estranged. And I think that that distinction drives and needs to drive a whole lot of uh, action uh, throughout the mental health community because it impacts those children in many instances for the rest of their lives. I had a woman come to see me. I used to be uh, on the faculty at Nova University and a woman who was a present faculty member there uh, in, the, in their school of nursing came to see me about oh, seven or eight months ago. She was in her mid-40s um, and she came in and she spent two hours with me and she was in my office about 30 seconds and she broke down into tears. And uh, she spent those two hours with me and uh, at the end of it I said, you know, you should feel free to come back if you would like. And what occurred over those two hours was basically a crying session where she was telling me a lot of the things that had happened to her as a young child. And it became absolutely clear that there was a, a task that I had to do within those two hours. Um, and that was to try and sort out what I really thought was going on. And because she came in, because she was afraid that she had been alienated. And as a result, therefore, she had tremendous guilt because she had never addressed the problem um, and felt very badly because if it were true, then she had been abusing, in essence, her other parent for many years. Um, and at the end of those two hours, I suggested to her, I thought that the evidence that she was presenting to me um, was far more in favor of an argument of alienation than anything else because there weren't good data that she was able to present to me that were not consistent with an alienation argument. And she called, she didn't come back to see me, but uh, she emailed me about three weeks later and she said, I can't tell you how much those two hours meant to me. I've reconnected with my dad. And so she avoided doing it until she almost had the authority of a professional telling her that you ought to do this and the reason. So it's very impactful on so many people's lives. I have one more question here, and I think we have a couple more that really pertain to what's going to be discussed later in the day. Um, before I read this, let me actually, uh, there's one more DSM topic I forgot to mention when I was showing the DSM-5 slides. And I said that the, uh, the, they're still considering this. The DSM-5 task force at times has opened up their website for input. And uh, they currently are open. In other words, if you were to go to the DSM-5 website, it says on it, uh, this is a time until June 15th for people to send in comments about what we've been doing so far. So if you want to, you're welcome to send comments to the people who run the DSM-5 task force, and then there's a thing called the Childhood and Adolescence Work Disorders Work Group. They're the people who are actually gonna address this issue. And if you wanna know who to send it to, that actually in the book that I've, that I've showed you, it actually has the names and addresses of these people. If you don't wanna buy the book, if you send me an email, I'll send you that chapter. <laughs> in other words, I can send you an email of the, of the chapter that has the names and addresses of the people at the DSM-5 that you can send your comments to uh, about this topic. So we, they've gotten thousands of comments, both for and against the idea of parental alienation in DSM. But if, if there are a few more, I think that'd be great. So let me read you this. This actually is an interesting story. And it doesn't, in, in this little story, parental alienation has not occurred, at least not yet. And estrangement has not occurred. But this is the kind of situation that, that would come up in a custody evaluation. In other words, let me read this to you. And when you're thinking about it, 
this is the kind of thing that you might hear in certain types of custody evaluations. Um, what happens when the father of the children has been absent due to workaholism, affairs with other women, and addictions, has never taken more than a superficial interest in the children, is personality disordered, is not trustworthy, and he insists after the divorce on having, but now he's, he's insisting on having access during which he will be caring for very young children for several days at a time, something he has never done before. And so in that circumstance, what if the mother, who's the primary parent, feels the children are at risk, left alone with him, and it, if she has realistic concerns for the well-being of her children? In other words, this is the kind of question that obviously comes up in a custody evaluation where you try to figure out the strengths and weaknesses of each parent, who's going to have custody of the child, and what should be the visitation arrangements for the non-custodial parent. And you can just imagine that getting discussed in this kind of case. I think the, the writer, though, is, is raising the possibility that can't you, she's sort of saying is, can't you see how that mother is, co is correctly concerned? And if this mother starts worrying about the children, it's not because she has a neurosis or she has a personality disorder, but she is, and it's not because the dad has already done anything bad. She's not accusing him, but she's accu she feels that he's not going to be competent in parenting the children. So, you know, that's what people go to court over, and the court is going to give them a schedule, and they need to abide by the schedule. And as Dr. Sauber says about 30 times in his book, that, the two th that in situations like this, the, the two things that people have to accept is, first of all, you have to follow what the court says, and secondly, you have to accept that the child is going to have two parents. So uh, I can see in this case how the mother would be worried. I think it would be important for the mother to not convey her worries to the kid, the kids. Because you can see if the mother is worried and, and the mother starts talking to the children and telling them, you know, if anything happens at daddy's house, call me, or as I've heard before, call 911. If daddy raises a hand, call 911 or something. And obviously in this kind of thing, the mom would have to be careful not to convey her worries to the children because you don't want the children to reject a relationship with their dad. You want them to have a relationship with their dad, but obviously you want, the, you want it to be done in a safe way. So I'm not sure exactly how to make that happen, but I'm not sure whether somebody should help him or, or maybe he should start with shorter periods of time, or you can, you can kind of see how a court might figure that out. But it, it's, a, it's a situation where the mother might be tempted to induce parental alienation but should be cautioned against doing that. I've run out of questions. I think you have, you have a couple more that no. I think really pertain to later in the day. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I think that we ought to um, defer these till later on in the day. I think we're about to, uh, any last question from the audience on this topic? Please, yep. <laughs> so the question has to do with people who, who reject it. Uh, well, I would say that there is a fringe group of people who believe that parental alienation doesn't even occur, doesn't exist, and that it was, the whole concept was just made up by uh, uh, mental health professionals and attorneys as a ploy to take children away from uh, concerned mothers, concerned parents. So I think there is a fringe group that, that feels that it doesn't even exist. The vast majority of people who work with children of divorced parents, nine, and I was involved with the poll last year, 98% of people who work with children of divorced parents agree that sometimes one parent can indoctrinate the child against the other parent, and the child refuses to see that parent without justification. So the vast majority of people agree that the concept happens. Not all those people agree with whether it should be in DSM. And the people who feel it should not be in DSM feel maybe there's not enough research, maybe we're not good enough about identifying it since we don't want to falsely, you know, we don't want to have false positives, we don't want to falsely, wrongly identify cases. Uh, maybe we need to do more research to really identify whether we have the eight criteria correct. 
And some of those people are concerned that there are cases where one parent uses this wrongly to, uh, to, get, them, to get the kids away from the other parent. That the, that in other words, this is the false allegation of parental alienation. And I'm sure everybody has, maybe has heard this at times. And I've heard that many, many times. And when I, whenever I hear it, I say to the person, can you give me an example? Can you give me an actual case, not just what happened to the friend of your friend, but an actual case where a parent, like a father, wrongly used or fraudulently used parental alienation to get the child away from the caretaking mother, the nurturing mother, the protective mother. Can you give me an actual case with a name on it that's either that's published in either the legal literature, you know, like a case that has gone to a court of appeals, or in the mental health literature? And uh, I've asked that for two, three years now, and I've actually been given maybe two cases that, that look like that may have happened. But anyway, that's the concern. I, I, I actually think it's kind of an urban legend that judges are doing that. I think there are many, many instances where people claim that happened, but as far as whether it actually happened, I think it's very unusual. Thank you very much. What I think is significant there, though, is the extent to which the opposition to this concept not only rejects the concept, but is vitriolic. Uh, the, the level of intensity, um, uh, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, if you think about the various diagnoses that have slowly drifted into society and then into the DSM over the last 50 years, every now and then it becomes obvious that, that there's a, a construct here that's, that's discreet enough to warrant a separate diagnosis. That's why the, 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 the book keeps on growing. But um, you, I can't think of many where the level of uh, negativism about the construct uh, and the absolute rejection of anything to do with the construct uh, was as strong as you see in some of the anti-websites. Uh, and I think that you know they, they use arguments like junk science and all the rest of it. Um, sort of pretty fascinating. The reality is, though, when you have a child who's profoundly alienated, you know, you know it. You may have to work on how to find out, but once you're there, you're there, like any other good diagnostic process. Maybe we'll, do you want to, got one more? You, you've given uh, three reasons as to why it should be included in the DSM. And aside from not accomplishing what those reasons would give, are there any other negative impacts of not including it in the DSM? Does this gentleman want to explain uh, where you're coming from? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <In> Toronto. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, I'm with Parental Alienation Awareness Organization. We're an advocacy group that tries to help people understand what parental alienation is, the, the, uh, the behaviors, the, uh, the, uh, the ramifications, and the remedies. Uh, and we get questions periodically from various sources, including the press, asking us about DSM and, and what, uh, uh, what ramifications are, are there in including it, what the conflicts around it are, and I'm asking what yeah. the negative uh, side if, of not. If you all haven't learned about the PAAO, did I say that right? Uh, website, you should visit it and you can talk to Bob here about it if you want. Uh, so so he, he says, the question is, are there any uh, unexpected or unwanted consequences if it's not included? And I think there are two main ones. One is that kids will not be identified. In the future, this won't be in textbooks as much. It won't be taught in social work school and psychology school. Uh, and so clinicians won't have a, a, a high enough awareness and it, it, the cases will not be identified early enough. The legal ramifications are that people who don't like this idea will, will use that as a, as a basis for saying this topic should not be raised in court that the words parental alienation have not been accepted by 
the scientific community, and that those words should not be raised in a legal situation because they're non-scientific. That already, there's already movement to do that. The state of California actually uh, attempted to pass a law in the state of California saying that the words parental alienation cannot be used in a child custody dispute. And it didn't get passed. It actually got passed, the, you know, they have a house, and I guess they have a house and a Senate or something like that. that. But that law actually, that bill actually got passed the house but did not get passed the Senate. So, so that did not become a law, but now it's been brought up again. So if it, if it, if it gets in the DSM, obviously that'll be evidence in court that this is accepted by the scientific community. If it doesn't get in, the opponents are gonna very clearly say, hey, that proves this is not a scientific uh, concept um, and it shouldn't even be brought up in court. I think we need to move on. Th we thank did. you all very much. I think we need to move on to yeah. the next agenda. Thank you very much.